Whether you've been in business for years or are just a startup trying to find success in the world as it is and what it will be in the future, we're finding new ways of thinking you can apply to the rest of your life. Welcome to Creative Warriors. This is more than career goals. This is business with a soul. Now prepare to create, serve, and be prosperous with your host, Jeffrey Shaw. Hey, Warriors. I am very excited to have Jim Joseph with us today. There's hardly an industry that doesn't have a lot of competition today. So how do you stand out from the rest? Show the world what's unique about you. Well, branding. In a world where, due to the internet, most of your clients are choosing your services or not, when you're not even there, your brand image is doing the talking for you. So what's your brand saying about you? Regain time and transform your commute, workout, or chores into fun, productive me time. Audible Books is the best way I know of to listen to books on the go. Audible Books is offering you a free audio book to see if you like it. Try it and love it or cancel it and keep your free Audible book either way. Audible Books, the most effective way I know to turn a mundane task into inspiring time. Go to creativewarriorsunite.com forward slash audible or hit the link in the show notes and pick up your free audio book today. If you're not sure what to listen to, check out my suggested book list on Creative Warriors Unite and then go to creativewarriorsunite.com forward slash audible and download your free audible book today. Welcome, Jim. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thrilled to have you here to discuss this really important topic of branding. So let me tell everyone a little bit more about your background. Marketing is a spectator sport, and Jim Joseph is one of the industry's most engaging, enthralling, and entertaining commentators. Entrepreneur of the Year, Agency of the Year, Consumer Launch Campaign of the Year, Most Creative Agency, Best Place to Work, Social Media Icon, Hall of Fame, These are the accolades that Jim Joseph has amassed through his long career in marketing. As the Chief Integrated Marketing Officer and President of the Americas for Cohen & Wolf, Jim has over 25 years of consumer marketing leadership. Jim's an award-winning author of the Experience Effect Trilogy, an instructor at New York University, and a member of the Board of Directors for the number one branding school in the country, the Brand Center at VCU. So, Jim, before you share your amazing insights with us about branding, we want to know a bit more about you personally. So you and I are both New Yorkers, and I'm sure, like me, you get asked all the time about what people should do when they visit New York City. So I'm curious, what do you enjoy doing on your own or with your children uh, when you have some time off in New York City? You know, I just recently moved to the Upper West Side. I've always been a downtown kind of guy, and I have completely rediscovered Central Park and rediscovered Central Park across all four seasons. It's just an amazing place to walk around, explore, grab a bite to eat, grab a drink, go on a, on a little um, ride. It's just it's the best place in the city, without a doubt, no matter, no matter the weather, no matter the season, no matter who you're with. Yeah, I have to agree with you on that. I mean, you just never get tired of exploring Central Park. I used to live on the Upper West Side as well. And I, I always, I'm always astonished by the idea that, that a group of people had the foresight to reserve such a huge piece of land when no one lived there. <laughs> no one it's, lived up that far. <laughs> it's so true. And we keep marveling how nobody through all these years has said, well, let's just slice off a little bit of it and sell it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it, it, it's it, amazing. Yeah, it it's truly amazing. is remarkable. So then what's the best piece of advice you've ever received, a meaningful quote or a favorite book that you would offer to inspire us and why? Ah, uh, you know, I got a piece of feedback probably about 10 years ago that has stuck with me and I really live by and really has changed my thinking. And that is, I tend to look at people the way I want them to be, as opposed to the way they are. And it's such a huge insight into my own processing and perceptions of people, but also how to work with various people in various teams. And when you look at people and you want them to complete a task, you have to understand what their skills are. Not the skills you want them to have or the skills that you have, but the skills that they have and what they bring to the table and how they can, can uniquely contribute. And then leverage them and, and use them to their maximum capability and make them as happy as they can based on who they are, not on who you want them to be. 
Well, it's interesting. There's actually some parallel to branding in that, in that there can be very easily this misperception between what you think is great and how the market you want to serve interprets that. So it's kind of an interesting comparison to your core skill set. Right. So there's certainly a lot more to branding today than the traditional logo and color scheme. And while that's still an important part of it, it's, it's one part of it. So what else do you believe is part of having a great brand today? I think one of the biggest pieces to really good branding is consistency. You have to really understand who you are as a brand, what you provide to your customers or your consumers, and then stick with that. And stick with it in your logo, as you mentioned, in your packaging, in your website presence, in your social media presence. You know, really have a firm grip on who you are, what's your tone of voice, what's your messaging, what's your communication style, what's your branding elements, and be consistent. That is the hallmark of a great brand. And I think it's even more important now that social media is such a huge channel for expressing who you are as a brand, that you need to be consistent in social media just like you are in other, other marketing elements. Yeah, you actually do a great job in the book about stressing the importance of the consistency. And, and I agree with you in part because of social media. I think part of the challenge today is uh, there's so many platforms for social media, but they all have their own unique vibe. I mean, how you show up on Facebook is different than Instagram and Twitter. And yet you somehow need to make sure your brand and your, the voice of your brand is constant, even though how people receive. I mean, Instagram has a very certain personality, uh, different rules, if you will, different, different rules of etiquette than, than Twitter or Facebook. And yet your brand still has to be consistent. Absolutely. And I think a lot of it is in tone of voice and word choice and communication style. And even though those channels are all very different and some you have to be extremely brief and some you can be a little bit more verbose, I still think that despite the fact that you use those channels differently, sometimes it's with a visual, sometimes it's with a video, sometimes it's with characters, but use the same tone of voice, the same word choice, the same style in terms of how you communicate. And that way, no matter where people experience your brand, they're experiencing it consistently, even if it's in a different channel with a different purpose. So now to add to this idea of, of uh, consistency, or maybe even to almost contradict it, and yet it's not a contradiction, I'd like to talk about brand diversity for a moment, because I find that fascinating. And you, you bring that up in the book uh, related to celebrities, for example. And I recently wrote an article about Lady Gaga, about the diversity of her brand. And Taylor Swift is another example, because as celebrities, they are their own brand. Right. So you know, we understand their brand and yet they've shown tremendous diversity. I mean, I said Lady Gaga has gone from, you know, the, the outrageous to the conservative with Tony Bennett. So what do you think holds their brand together or what can we learn from that so that we can be diverse and yet people still know what our brand stands for? Yeah, very, very interesting. And I think it comes from having a personal mission and having a personal positioning statement. When you hear Lady Gaga speak and when she talks about all of the different things that she has going on, they all come from a very same core place, which is about herself, but on also helping others be who they are and expressing themselves for who they are and what they want to be. And for her, it's through creativity. And it's by helping other people be creative and express who they are and, and all of those kinds of things. But that is her core essence and what she is believes that she's on this planet for. So then, of course, it makes sense for her to express herself creatively with a partnership with Tony Bennett or to have a video called Born This Way or to help LGBT youth um, get, get guidance and counseling because she's all about being who you are, expressing yourself and going for it. So while it looks very diverse in terms of the things she does, they all come from the same central place. I, you know, that you just hit the nail on the head. That is exactly right. I mean, her core message is absolutely be who you are. And that does offer the opportunity for more, uh, more diversity. And Geico Insurance, from a marketing perspective, is another company I've always been fascinated with because technically they've pretty much broken all the rules of brand consistency, right? <laughs> I mean, they have so many things going on. There's the guy, there's the gecko there in the past. There was the caveman. Recently, there's been the squealing pig. Like, and yet we always know it's Geico. What is there? What in that example of diversity, what do you think is holding it together? 
I actually think there's two things. I think executionally, there's an attitude that holds it together and kind of a, a swagger and a way of being that holds it together so that while the personalities vary and the messaging varies <clears throat> and the techniques vary, they still come with the same kind of attitude and same kind of swagger. But even more important, I think what holds it together is a sense of what their customer is looking for in, in their product. So while the, the gecko was a very specific execution, he was all about saving money because there's a segment of their population that just wants to save money when they buy insurance. That's all they care about is price. Other segments of their customers care about service. So they have a different execution. And a lot of that was the celebrity campaigns, which was all about service. And then there's a segment of their population, their customer population, that just wants it to be simple. They don't, they find it overcomplicated, they find it intimidating and overwhelming. Just make it simple, a la the caveman. So simple, even a caveman can do it. Hmm. So what holds those all together is an innate knowledge of what their customer wants. And then playing it back to them with a very similar swagger, attitude, tone of voice that makes it feel like it's all coming from the same place, even though... At first glance, it feels like it's coming from very different brands. That's fantastic. I, I never got that. You know, it's interesting. I mean, I guess I'm a, as a marketer myself, I'm always watching marketing. I never saw it, but you're absolutely right. Their core message is understanding their customer, understanding right. what their customer wants, which is something you speak about a lot in the book. And I think is really valuable for us to talk about too, is understanding your client's behavior when creating your brand. I, I refer to it often with my coaching clients as being in their shoes. So right. tell us a little bit more about what it means to be in their shoes, you refer to it also as being empathetic and really understanding not just their needs, but also their behavior for your target audience. Very true. And in fact, I, I write and talk about this quite a bit, whether it's for big mega brands like Coca-Cola, American Express, or for small businesses or for entrepreneurs, or even for us as people, branding begins and ends with who your customer is. It's all about understanding who your customer is, what they want, what they're going through in their lives, and understanding, as you say, their behaviors. Because if you stay just central to who you think you are as a brand, you will not long have a business because your customers won't be able to relate to what you offer and they'll find another option that does. So it's all about really understanding what they go through in their lives and how your brand can fit into their lives. I, I counsel a lot of our clients that our consumers aren't thinking about our brand 24-7 like we are as brand marketers. You know, we're so obsessed with our brand because we work on it all the time that we just assume our customers are doing the same thing. But in fact, they only think about us when they need us in their life and when it's w woven into their lives. So until you understand their behaviors and how they spend their day and what they worry about and what keeps them up at night and the things that they fear... Only then can you understand how you can add value, how you can help them, how you can over, help them overcome things, how you can help them get ready for things. It's through those behaviors and understanding about those behaviors and how those behaviors change over time. Then you have a proposition for your customers and you become truly a brand and not just a product you're trying to sell to them. Yeah, I think well, there's a lot to unpack in that because you're right. I mean, it also changes over time too. And that's something I'm always telling my clients to be really highly sensitive to how people's lives are changing because you may need to change the way you do business, whether it's your marketing or the services that you provide. But I'm also curious whether you have any practical tips, particularly if they are not their client. You know, as I, when I built my photography business serving a very affluent clientele, I didn't come from that. So right. I know what I did to understand their view of the world I had ever been exposed to before. So what are some of your tips to help someone if they're serving a target audience that's not them? How do they gain the empathy and the understanding? Sure. In fact, most of the time as marketers or even as business owners, our customers aren't like us. That is the norm, actually. And in many cases, I think it's worse if your customer is similar to you because then you just apply your own emotions and needs and opinions. And you're actually not thinking about your customers. You're just thinking about what you want. So I agree. I agree a hundred percent. Thank <laughs> you for saying that. I mean, I, I, on both accounts, in most cases, people are serving, you know, we're not our own clients. And I actually think it's incredibly difficult if you were so perfectly said. Right, right. 
Um, so most of the time, you know, you're not very similar to your to your target audience or to your customers. And again, I, I talk to small business owners and entrepreneurs about this all the time. People just assume that they need to have these huge market research budgets and teams and staff and surveys to really understand their audience. And in fact, yes, that's very helpful. And the big mega brands do that. And they have a very deep understanding of their audience as a result. But there are some very simple things that you can do that really don't cost a lot of money to get into the headspace of, of, your, of your customer. And that's what social media has opened up for us probably more than anything. You can go on to um, websites, certainly. You can go into chat rooms and forums. You can go on to Twitter. And you can follow your customers and see what they're sharing, what they're commenting on, the words they use, what times of day they're posting the most and the kinds of things and how things change over the course of a day in terms of what they post. You can get an amazing, amazing sense of what, what these people are all about and what they care about by just following them in social media. And then what I often do and I counsel folks to do is read the magazines they read, go to the websites they go to, go to the movies that they talk about, watch the television shows, you know, down, download the, the series that they're watching. Because again, you get into the psyche of what they are interested in, what they care about and what entertains them. And you'd be amazed how you suddenly get a really kind of gut feel for what makes them tick. And then when you're developing a marketing program for them, messaging or content, you can, you can start to use some judgment about what you think will engage with them because you've gotten to know them. And you've gotten to know them socially and where they are in a very raw, real environment that I think in some ways is even more enlightening than a big, huge market research study, which is somewhat artificial in nature. Hmm, that's great. Is it also valuable? Uh, Cause I know I often suggest to my, the small businesses that I coach that they, is it also valuable to look at some of the larger companies? Um, so for example, I happen to, I happen to like to watch target. Uh, I think target as a company can be really helpful for a lot of small businesses to watch what they do because uh, the, the typical target customer is value conscious more than cost conscious. And for most small businesses, they want to attract value conscious customer more than the cost conscious customer. So is there still value in watching what some of the big guys do and uh, taking advantage of some of the research they've done? Absolutely. In fact, that's kind of the premise behind my, my little mantra, which is marketing is a spectator sport. The more you can observe what other brands are doing, the more you can learn from them and then reapply it to your business. In fact, to your point earlier about how do you understand a target market if they're very different than you are, that's also a great way is take a look at the brands that are targeting those folks and see what they're doing, the language they're using, the content they're posting, the style they use to communicate to them. Because chances are they've got pretty deep knowledge and they know what they're doing. Brands like Target, Coca-Cola, American Express, Starbucks. I mean, these folks spend a lot of time getting to know their customers. So we can kind of assume they, they kind of know what they're doing. So take a cue from what they're doing and, and apply it to your business. It, it's, it's the premise behind marketing as a spectator sport is that you can learn a lot by what other people are doing. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great advice. Even, even if you're comparing yourself to retail, Although it, theirs might be brick and mortar and your primary way of communicating to clients or prospective clients might be your website, there's still a correlation. You know, targets, the look of a target store is a little bit more on the cleaner side. You know, again, how your website looks, whether it's how cluttered it is, how simple it is, can also describe your price point and your target audience and be in comparison to some of those large retailers as well. Absolutely. So now our audience at Creative Warriors are in businesses selling our talent, if you will. And Often, we are our own brand. So what do you think are some of the nuances of branding when you are your brand? Well, I like to think that we are all brands, each of us, and that if we thought about ourselves that way, perhaps could be even more successful than we already are because some of the principles of good branding for the big brands actually apply to personal branding as well. So having a really good understanding of who you are and what you offer and what you uniquely bring to wherever you are is, is a guiding principle in branding and is also a guiding principle in personal success as well. And having a very clear understanding of where your strengths are and what you like to do and focusing in on those to offer to, to your um, team is, is a great way to build your personal brand. And exactly what I was just talking about, which is 
one principle of good branding is always putting your customer first. If you think about those around you, your teammates, your clients, uh, the people you interact with, even your coworkers, if you think of them as customers and what do they need from you, you know, what are they looking from you, how could you make their lives more valuable, how can you help them, if you serve yourself that way, you're probably going to get more work, more collaboration, more attention back than if you just go into it thinking about what your own needs are and what you want to do. You know, act like a brand, act like your customer comes first, act like you really want to know what's going on in their lives and how you can help and you'll probably be more successful. Yeah, I have to say having over the 30 years watching uh, various, particularly creative entrepreneurs go into business. One of the common mistakes is, is they, they go into business, they build the business and then they run around looking for customers to fill the, the void in that business, as opposed to the way a proper business should be built is identify the customers, identify their needs and their desires first, and then build the business for them. Right. Yeah. But it is particularly as I said in the creative businesses, because it usually, you know, it starts as a hobby or it's something we're good at and then it evolves and suddenly you find yourself in business. So inevitably a lot of creative businesses are inherently built upside down. That's what I have found. I think that's true. And also being creative is so personal. I mean, I consider myself a creative person, even though I've been on the business side most of my career. But even when I had my own agency, I was the creative director as well as the as well as the suit, if you will. And creativity and developing creative, whatever form it may be, is so personal. You know, it has come from your soul. And it's, you know, I know this from writing my own books. In fact, I just released a new book. It's so personal. And it's coming from who you are and your talent and how you're uniquely putting that together, that it's very easy to lose sight of the fact that you have a buyer on the other side of the table. And you need to fulfill their needs, not just your own. And while you are the expert and you're certainly the creative expert and you know how to communicate a message and how to pull it all together, it still has to fit what the buyer is looking for. And it's very hard to separate that when you're a creative. But I've seen through the years that the really good, successful, groundbreaking creatives know how to balance that. You know, you also bring up a gr another great point. You and I have both been in business and in marketing for a lot of years. And one thing that's changed is that we used to talk a lot about finding your perfect client, your target audience, kind of the broader spectrum, if you will, where nowadays we hear more often the term avatar or picking one customer who represents the whole and really focusing in on them, their behaviors, what they want. So and I, you know, things are always changing and there's always a trend, but do you have a feeling as to whether one is truly better than the other? Is it better to focus on the whole or to focus on the individual? Very interesting debate. I think it depends on who you are and what your, and what your talents are. The notion of focusing on the individual and focusing on the avatar, that makes sense from a marketing standpoint, because you're focusing on your customer and you're honing in on them. And if that's a big enough market for you, then I think that makes incredible sense. Uh, but it could also be very limiting because if you're going to limit yourself to just focusing on one kind of a client or one kind of a customer and one kind of a specific scenario, there may not be enough of them <laughs> to feed you every day for uh, over the course of your career. So I have found the most successful creatives to be pretty flexible and to be able to apply their talents to many, many, many different situations, different industries, different client scenarios, different team scenarios, uh, different avatars, if you will. I think that flexibility breeds more success. And uh, actually, I believe it breeds better creativity. Hmm. Along those lines, you also mentioned that a good brand shouldn't appeal to everyone. Right. And, and needs to be created specifically for target audience. So tell us more about that, because I think that's that's going to be a, a hard thing for small businesses to swallow because they, they want as much business as possible. But the reality is, is that your brand image is really should be designed to not appeal to everyone so that you're calling forward the right person. A key principle in branding is that consumers, customers, clients, whoever, they need to have a very firm understanding of who you are and what you offer to them. So if you try to be everything to everybody and no one person will look to you and say, OK, I get what you're about and you're for me, because what they'll see is maybe in this message you were for them, but in that message you were for somebody else and that message you were for somebody else again. 
So that focus and clarity of who you are and what you offer, I think is, is a key principle of branding and will ultimately make you successful. If you try to be all over the map and do a little bit for everybody, then that gets you in, in trouble. And we've seen repeated examples through the years of brands that have tried to evolve by trying to become everything to everybody. And they ultimately dilute what they're all about. And then no one really knows what they offer. And then therefore they, they suffer. Hmm. And not to pick on anybody, but I think the gap is, is a good example of that. You know, if you ask people what the gap is all about, the retail store, the gap, I'm not sure folks could give you a very clear articulation of what they offer because it hasn't been clear. They've tried to be all things to everybody. They've tried to compete with everybody. And I think they've lost their clarity as a result. I absolutely agree with you. I mean, there was a time you kind of understood what the gap represented, you know, khakis. <laughs> you know, you right. sort of got a certain look, but I agree. I think they've, they've sort of lost their, their place. They started, uh, yeah, go, kind of going to some odd marketing directions. So then is there, is there a difference then between branding and positioning or, or I'm sure there's a difference. So what do, how would you break apart the two branding and positioning and what they mean? They go hand in hand, certainly. And in order to have a great brand, you have to have a solid positioning. And positioning is one of those nebulous terms that I think most people get wrong and they don't really quite understand it. And they try to overcomplicate it because it's, it's actually quite simple. And in my mind, and I teach this in my NYU class, what positioning really is, and it's literally the word positioning, is the space that you want to occupy in your customer's mind when they think of you. You know, what emotional space do you want to have logged in their head when they think of your brand? And that is how you want to be positioned. You want to position it in their mind. And then branding is all of the ways that brings that positioning to life, whether it's through packaging, logo, website, content, videos, whatever it is, all that branding materials that they see should all reinforce that one positioning and how they think about you in, in your mind. And that positioning should be inherently very emotional. You know, I, I think of Starbucks as a great example. You know, Starbucks is not positioned necessarily as a cup of coffee or as a place that you get coffee. That's not how they want you to think about them when you do think about them. They want you to think that they are an active member of the community. In fact, they are the community for whatever location they're in. That's how they want you to think about them. That's how they want to be positioned. So then all of the branding that they do and all the marketing activity they do reinforces that. It's not just about selling you a cup of coffee. It's actually about giving you a place to come to feel a part of the community. Then suggest that one, either if they're going into business, consider their positioning, or if you're already in business, consider the positioning that you already have and then build your branding on that. So sort of positioning first. Right. Exactly. Very cool. So you also, which I, I loved it, you, you mentioned that good marketing is fundamentally love, respect, and empathy for your customers. And we, we talked a little bit about uh, empathy, um, but the love and respect part sort of stood out to me. And you also mentioned that good branding was a break from the chaotic lifestyle for clients. So tell us more about that, because that just sounds, I mean, it sounds amazing <laughs> that, <laughs> that our branding can actually cut through you know, chaos and, and make people's lives easier. And how so? Well, it's interesting. I, I think it's on two different fronts. And a lot of the brand activity we've been seeing in the last 12 months or 18 months, I think is really, really exemplary of this. And some may call it a trend. I actually think it's just an evolution of really good marketing. And that's brand after brand after brand, Tylenol, Honeymade, Nike, coming to terms with what's important to their customers and then standing behind them, whether it's, whether it's marriage equality, interracial relationships, adoption, tax reform, gun control, whatever it is that is a public issue or a public debate, these brands understand where their customers stand and they're standing behind them. Tylenol just released uh, a new campaign that's all about family and not having to fight to be a family, that families come in all ways, shapes, forms, colors, combinations, and that nobody should fight to be a family. That is showing love and respect for your customers and standing behind them. That's much more powerful than any kind of a message that says, we'll get rid of your headache in four hours 
Well, of course you'll get rid of my headache in four hours. You're Tylenol. I know that already. You're a pain reliever. I, I take that for granted. But the fact that you love and respect and stand behind me, okay, I want your brand. Yeah. And we're seeing yeah. more and more of that happen as as brands evolve their marketing and try to get deeper and deeper engagements with their customers. Absolutely correct. And it was a great example because that Tylenol campaign is really moving. Hopefully most of you warriors have seen it because it's really well done. Where do you think most small businesses fall apart when it comes to their branding? A couple areas. I think tactically they fall apart because they're so caught up in the day to day and fire drills and getting stuff out the door that they don't think about the bigger picture of their branding and they don't think about the, um, the overall direction that the business is going because they're so caught up in the day to day and they never get out of their own way as a result. And it's very hard to take a step back, but as a small business owner, you, you have to take a step back, pull away from the day to day and the fire drills and the deadlines and think about who you are and think about your customer and put together a plan that's going to grow your business. I think that's number one. I also think that number two is that they build their brand around functional benefits. They think about what they do and they think about what they can do for their customers. And the problem with that approach is that that does not separate you from your customers. So Tylenol, no offense to anybody, but probably doesn't relieve a headache any better than any other pain reliever. And a consultant, no offense to anybody, but they probably do their work probably pretty similar to other consultants in their same field. It's very hard to separate functional benefits and what you functionally do for your customers. So you have to build a bigger brand and a bigger brand premise, and it has to be built around emotions and how people feel when they work with you, you know, how your customers feel when you consult with them, how <clears throat> customers feel when they take Tylenol, like you were just saying. That's brand building. And the functional attributes aren't going to separate you, but the emotional attributes will. That's fantastic. Just terrific. Great advice for all warriors to take to heart. Uh, so, Jim, thank you for all that. And in a moment, I'm going to ask you our discovery round questions. So while you're preparing yourself for these thought provoking questions, we're going to hear a brief message and we'll be right back. Hey, warrior, do you have an awesome talent but are struggling to make it in business? How great would it feel to be respected for your work and be abundantly compensated? Pretty great, of course. CreativeWarriorUnleashed.com is where you'll find a community of warriors just like you, learning the specific things you need to know when you're in business marketing yourself and your talent. Creative Warrior Unleashed is a six-month go-at-your-own-pace coaching program with seven training modules, complete assignments and templates, weekly coaching calls, your own personal dashboard with lifetime access, and six months of coaching support. You will finally have the business you want and the lifestyle of your dreams. So don't delay your success any longer. Hop on over to creativewarriorunleashed.com to learn more. All right, Jim, it is time for our discovery round questions. The first question is, what drives you crazy? <laughs> Mediocrity drives me up the wall. The, the feeling that people just want to check it off the list and move on and, and don't necessarily care that they're doing their best work makes me absolutely crazy. That's great. The second question is looking back, what's something you can't believe you did for your career? I can't believe I started my own agency at the old, old age of 32 years old. I thought I was so old and looking back, I was so young and so naive and I had no idea what I was doing and I started my own agency. Very cool. And is there something in common in everything that inspires you? Creativity, honestly. Uh, I am completely attracted to people that are creative. I'm completely impressed and in awe of anything that is creative. I'm completely drawn to creativity. And not necessarily the, the visual or the spoken or written word or what we would define as creativity, but just creativity in style and approach and problem solving and child rearing and relationship management and, and your whole sort of gestalt. I love people that are creative. That's awesome. All right. Our last discovery round question, the doozy, is imagine you are sitting around a campfire and out of the darkness appears your greatest enemy, which does not have to be a person. What inner warrior inside yourself do you call upon and why? My greatest enemy by far and my biggest fear, which I would probably put the two of those together, is 
having to watch my children fail. To me, that is the biggest enemy because it's such a balancing act between allowing your children to do their thing and to discover the world and to figure out what they're good at and to experiment and try things. Balancing that with knowing that they're going to make a mistake, knowing that they're going to stumble, watching them make a mistake, watching them make big mistakes, and yet knowing that they have to go through that. And that fear of failure for them, to me, is my biggest enemy. And what I pull out of myself when I see that happening is I go into safety net mode. You know, I put a safety net under them. I can't stop them. I can't necessarily prevent them. I can't jump in front of the, of the train necessarily, but I can be there to help them sort it out, pick up the pieces, figure out their options, help them weigh their own decisions. I can be their safety net when they're going through that. Now, my children are adults now, so it's a little bit different than when they were young, but it's a bit of a parenting style that I've applied appropriately at every stage they've been at. Yeah. As a parent myself, I don't know. I think we're always still a safety net. So we're, we're <laughs> talking about the safety net warrior. I love it. So Jim has a very unique and generous offer for us. And that is he is going to give away six copies, six hard copy of his book, The Experience Effect, for the six, first six people who tweet him. So you have to tweet him at Jim Joseph EXP on Twitter. So it's at Jim Joseph EXP. The first six people will get a hard copy of the experience effect. So thank you for that. That's awesome. So be sure to join us at creativewarriorsunite.com where you can get free gifts from other podcast guests, today's show notes, and plenty of free resources carefully curated for the creative warriors community. So Jim, thank you so much for being here. It's really been a pleasure. Oh, thank you. Lots of fun. Lots of fun. Terrific. So that's it for now, Warriors. Let's go out, create, serve, and be prosperous. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Creative Warriors. Make sure you visit our website, creativewarriorsunite.com, for more information on our online coaching program, The Creative Warrior Unleashed, to provide you with practical action steps to achieve your goals. We look forward to seeing you next time. So until then, create, serve, and be prosperous.